Speaking the truth about money is for anyone ready and willing to examine their negative thinking about money, let go of the false narrative of the scarcity mindset, and has the courage to change the way they think and talk about money. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's broadcast of Speaking the Truth About Money with Martin Coward and Joy the Wise Woman. I am both Martin Coward and I am also known as Joy the Wise Woman. Joy the Wise Woman is my divine avatar, my divine intuition that guides me through this broadcast and most everything else in my life. So I'm so excited today to bring in this special guest who is doing some incredible work around the world for the LGBTQI community. He is the president of UN Globe, and he is a part of the ILO, the International Labor Organization. But his focus is on the LGBTQI community. And the, the president, I'll let him tell you a little bit more about exactly what the president of UN Globe is their purpose and what they do about. But it's my understanding it is it is the voice of the LGBTQI community in the United Nations across the globe. So I'm really excited to have my guest, Gertatin Sandhu from the United Kingdom on as my guest today. So tell me a little, tell us, let's start by let's getting us to know a little bit about who you are, how you became the president of the, of the UN globe and what's going on in that particular arena today and what's exciting in your world. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you for the lovely introduction and for foremost inviting me to share this space with you. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I'm indeed Gujaratan. Uh, most people know me as Nanu. My pronouns are they, he. Um, I am the currently uh, serving president of UN Globe, which is the group that represents LGBTIQ plus personnel and their dependents or independence um, in the inner and across the United Nations system. Uh, Globe, um, when it first started, stood for gay, lesbian or bisexual employees. So Globe. Um, it's now become a group that advocates for the rights and well, advocates for a more inclusive and diverse and respectful workplace for everyone, in particular LGBTIQ plus people. Um, well, I've I've been on um, part of the UN Globe Board since 2014. I, in fact, joined the UN system, the International Labour Organization, um, back in 2006. It wasn't only until 2013-14 that I discovered UN Globe and became more in back active and engaged in what, um, what it's doing to um, champion in and across the UN system. On a personal um, level, I can tell you more about what we do. And yeah, but I wanna, I'll get to that in a second. And I got, I got a good question for you. But I want to know what, what person, okay. like, what, what, how did you person, what, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't give our lives to something. We don't live a life for something unless there's something we have some passion around. What is it? Why, where, where does your passion come from around this, 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 this service that you do for the world and for our community? Where did that come from? Um, well, <clears throat> actually started way before the UN. Um, I grew up in the UK, I'm born to British, um, uh, born, born to Sikh Punjabi migrant parents in the UK. Um, I grew up in, two, well, just a little bit of backstory about me. I grew up in two different cultures, both a British culture and a Punjabi culture, um, in a diaspora community. And I um, often struggled with my identity a lot. You know, um, was I British? Was I uh, Indian? Um, and also st struggled with other aspects of myself as well. Um, and in fact, well, in terms of my Britishness and my Punjabi, um, I also suffered from a lot of racism. As you can tell, I'm a person of faith and color. Um, and growing up in a community where at a time when there was a lot of xenophobia, a lot of anti-migration immigrant st um, sentiment, as well as racism or, and lack of, lack of knowledge of people who looked like me. Um, and so growing up, I always had this sort of sense of confusion in, over my identities and who, where I actually belonged. In addition to that, I, I grew up, um, not, I grew up with, I was always one of these quirky children um, and 
um, <laughs> really into my the arts and the dance and um, and you can get where I'm going with this. And I didn't really fit into you know masculine roles. And I was always told that you know I should have been the I should have been a girl. Um, as to say that you know I you know being girl was inferior. It was only until later on in my teenage years that I actually realized that, you know, what there were, that being a girl or being referred to as feminine was actually a, um, a implication or a, a indirect reference to being uh, gay. And so, and, and at that point I knew that, well, being gay was being wrong and you couldn't be gay because this is something that we were brought, brought up to believe. Um, I started to take on, you know, these sort of toxic behaviors. Um, it wasn't until, you know, I moved here much later in life. I moved here to Geneva, Switzerland uh, to pursue a career at the United Nations and start uh, an internship at the um, ILO. That I felt a sort of sense of not having to look over my shoulder and be myself a little bit more and explore another part of me. That was fine in my personal life, but in my professional life, I was advised not to come out at work. Um, this consequently pushed me further back in the closet. I was still, you know, suffering from internalized homophobia, internalized racism. Um, and much further down the line, I sort of ended up in therapy and trying to work on myself and accept those parts of myself that I wasn't really willing to, or um, that I thought I had acknowledged, but wasn't willing to. And many years after therapy, I came across UN Globe in the workplace and I went, oh, wow, there's more of us. There's a whole community. Um, and um, we need to galvanize and we need to be uh, doing more. And I always felt that I wanted and needed to give back to, so that other people didn't have to go through what I went through. Um, and that it was okay to be LGBTIQ plus and identify as LGBTIQ plus in the UN system, that you didn't have to come out in the workplace. It wasn't, you know, it was, if providing wasn't, it was, if it's, um, it's, it's done on your terms. Um, so for me, um, you know, instantly jumped into this movement and became um, more and more passionate about it. I think because at the same time, it was so cathartic for me. I think I started learning more about myself than anyone else. I think it was, you know, um, tearing back those sort of toxic layers of um, performance masculinity, internalized homophobia, internalized racism. And it's really sort of allowed me to come to a point in my life where I'm now, you know, sitting here um, watching, um, talking to you, um, where I can talk to you in, on my own terms and conditions, where I can be here in the harness on myself, um, as a, f a good friend of my um, says to me, you know, we can actually sit here and be in, be in the wholeness and the completeness on myself. It was always, you know, growing up was always a struggle between different, you know, where I can be and what I can be in different parts and different audiences or different settings. Here I can, f I feel that I can bring every single part of myself at this very, very moment. Um, so that brought me to UN Globe um, and just the, the sort of sentiment to give wow. back. Um, I come from a Sikh community. I'm, I'm Sikh of faith. I'm, I belong to the Sikh faith. And we have this concept of Seva. Seva means selfless service. And this is what, have grown up with, you know, and I always thought that seva happens within, um, it always happens within the four walls of a temple or a place of worship, where in fact, coming into the queer community, what I've learned is that seva does not happen or the service does not happen within the four walls of a temple, but goes beyond it, ha happens within your own community. And it's been an opportunity, and I'm very lucky that I have been able to do this. Um, so, you know, as much as I'm sure people are um, here, thank you, thank you. It's actually me that's thankful because I've been able to one learn about myself and I'm able to right. fulfill my duty in 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 in, in, in uh, as per my um, my faith. Yeah, that is a I love that story, and it, you know, you know, it it, it it's I talk I talk to gay people all over the world, queer people all over the world all the time, and it's always amazing, and it's just is is our history and our past, and that we I don't I, it's rare particularly people who are a little, maybe some of the younger generation that we don't have to deal with something like certain parts of ourselves that we're told are wrong. And then when you wrote, when you take all of those things, you wrote, grew up in a lot of trauma, my, my, my brother. I mean, you got two different faiths, you got two different backgrounds, you got racism, you've got 
all sorts of anti, 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 anti is pointing at you as a young person that's bound to have to traumatize us. But mm-hmm. I find what you're sharing with me is that we, it's that traumatizing, it's that horrible, painful experience that we were able to say, wait a minute, none of that stuff is true. I'm really, and when you step into your power as an authentic gay man and claim your identity as a, as a proud, chic gay man in public forum like this, that empowers you and other gay people and queer people to step up in that because that's where our power is. Our power is in our authenticity. Indeed, it is. So, Indeed. and so that is really what I just wanted to just pull out of that beautiful story of your of your coming out, really, and coming out to to, to understanding really what a beautiful, powerful, loving, queer person you are. You know, and I just want to acknowledge that because that's where your passion is. That's what's driving you to be a part of the, I'm, I'm going to make up, that's what's driving you to be uh, the president of the United, uh, of the UN globe, because you you want other people, you want to end suffering in the world. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. And I think it's also, you know, realizing that, you know, at one point you don't just, you know, a lot of our community think that, oh, you come out and that's it, your work's done, actually that's when the work actually starts. Yeah. You start to lay, take away the layers of hate, the layers of internalized homophobia. I think there's so much um, often toxicity within our communities, within the LGBTIQ plus community, in terms of xenophobia, in terms of um, uh, misogyny, racism, um, a lot of hate. Um, so, yeah. um, and we do this to ourselves and we put, the, um, and I think that has got, that work has really got to start. Um, we really got to, um, we really have to take a look inwards as well as much as we would. It's, it's pretty- always a look inwards. That's where, that's where life is, by the way. We, the, the, what we see out there is a reflection of what we have in here. Indeed. Indeed. And you used the word a while ago about homophobia. You were taught as a young boy like I was, that there was something missing in you. You weren't quite a normal boy and that you learned mm-hmm. to hate that part of yourself. Indeed. You know, and so what we have to be patient with is realize that when people hate us, they really hate themselves in some way. Mm-hmm. They really are. It's really a self attack. They think they're attack. They're projecting their dislike of themselves on others. So when we can come into a public forum like this and we can sort of bust that apart and say, actually, do you really hate us? Do you really hate that part of yourself that you don't know? Mm, indeed. Or, okay, indeed. Or can you do what we've done and learn to love those parts of ourselves because that's where our power is? Because mm-hmm. I'll tell you this, anybody out there who's hating us hates themselves. Indeed. For some reason. Yeah. And that's disconnecting them from their power and their divine power. So when we do our work in the world, I mean, as a coach and all that, I'm a coach and you do what you, what you do. It's really to me what all I do every single day is to remove those shadows of of, of limiting beliefs about ourselves when we don't like ourselves. That's what shadow work is. I'm a shadow work teacher and coach and shadow work is just simply learning to like the parts of ourselves we don't like and to love those and embrace them and bring them into our lives because that's how we become more fully wholehearted human beings. And when we're in that space, that's how we can become safe. We can become change agents for the world. But we've got mm-hmm. to start with loving. Like you said, we've got to start with loving ourselves and we've got to do the, do our own inner work to get through that those traumas that told us we were something less than, than a than a normal boy or a regular human being. So I really I really thank you for coming on here today and just sharing your story with us and being vulnerable because that's what that's what that's what saves people's lives because there there are young queer people out there in the world who are who are still afraid coming out of the closet. And and particularly in parts of the world where you can be killed for that. I work a lot yeah. with with the Africans and and uh, and I'm, I'm, I got a, a project I'll talk about a little bit later, and I'd love to get some of your thoughts about it because it does involve the, the Kenyan government and the UNHRC in, in, in Kenya. Um, and we're working with them on a, on a specific, specific project, and I'm really excited about that. And I'd love to get some your comments on that in a few minutes. But before we get to that, what I'd really like to know is, uh, in your role as the president of the UN Global and being part of the labor force and making a difference, what would be... What would what, what would you love to, to to achieve in 2022 that would make a real difference in the world and you really feel like you made an impact? Oh wow, um, that's a big question. I think um, 
there's a lot of work to be done. I, I, and I think um, if I can get through to one person, you know, to under help people understand what um, where what how our movement and LGBTIQ plus people do not live in a vacuum, how our lives are intersectional. I think that's very very key, and to see a more a mainstreamed approach into that and seeing that being taken on board and moved forward is really, really key. I think, you know, often we talk about, you know, marriage equality, about parental leave or um, parent rights, the right to adopt, the right to have surrogacy, et cetera, et cetera, the right to have children. Yes, those are very, very key, important moments, but I think those are so, they're just, they are individual rights, right? How do we move around for advocating for others and other members of our community. So it's not just um, it's it's not just about um, um, individualistic rights, but a more collective. Right. I love that because what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say, is that we need to we need to get away from the from from getting bills passed. Those are not the other. They're not important. They are very we important. We need, to start, yeah. we, we need to start with relationship building. Mm -hmm. We need we need people to understand what's missing in their lives by not having these bonds of trust with gay people. You know, it wouldn't. Yeah, indeed. And it, it does go beyond. Uh, it's not just. Yes. As you said, um, and thank you for, you know, um, uh, setting the record straight there. It, it is indeed. Bills are very important. Laws are very important. Legislation is very important. Policies are very important. But how do we have. Um, greater solidarity amongst our communities. I know yeah. LGBTIQ plus people, and uh, let me give you an example here. Um, great referendum, uh, Switzerland um, works in uh, in terms of referendums. So two referendums happening on the same weekend, one for marriage equality, number two was for uh, greater taxation uh, for uh, multinationals and corporations. You had LGBTIQ plus people championing the marriage equality. And you ask the same people, what are you voting for greater taxation for um, for multinationals? They said no, um, because that means my company gets charged more tax or I will get charged more tax. My wealth will get charged more tax. However, did you know that a majority of LGBTIQ plus people live in poverty uh, below, you know, poverty thresholds? So it's not just so what we've done is just, well, my rights are fine. Anyone else? Can go away actually i don't care about the rest of rest of you and uh, we see that also when we're talking about uh refugees and um and migrants we see large uh, majority is a uh, majority of lgbt or we're seeing not increasing but um, lgbtiq plus people who um spouse um homo national what we call homo nationalism we don't need foreigners uh, yet when we know that many of our siblings um, are suffering from homophobia, biphobia, transphobia in the countries because of um, because of um, laws that um, that criminalise um, um, same sex intimacy or uh, or or trans people, um, so you know and need to flee their countries because of extreme violence, and yet we're we're saying we don't want more refugee. We you know that sort of that yeah. kind of solidarity is very very key here. I think. Um, you know, looking at the issue of climate justice, tax justice, environmental justice, linking this to then, you know, um, the, the workers' rights movement, the right to freedom of association and collective bargaining, the right to strike, you know, these are fundamental freedoms that in essence impact our community. And one day we will need those rights. But by the time we get there, because we're so busy focusing on our individualistic rights, those would have eroded away, yeah. right? I and we're agree. seeing them eroded, eroded away day by day by day. And if we don't, and, and it's not, and it's getting that right balance of our individual rights as humans and, and our good rights as, as, as a collective. So it's what we really need to find that balance. And then it also goes into um, issues of, um, you know, Black Lives Matter. We saw, you know, and we see this constantly espousing of hate within uh, within uh, queer spaces. You know, you don't, you just have to go into some of these these applications, and you see some of that um, that hate being um, projected out there. Um, and I think that really needs to be tackled. And I think um, those questions of, you know, and that's why I think stopping at a point that of 
of self acceptance, you know, and and saying yes, this is I accept my sexuality. But are we working on those other shadow selves? What are you doing about your internalized racism? What are you doing about your internalized uh, xenophobia, your uh, racism, your, um, yeah. your classism, your ableism? Where are you working on those? How are you bringing the, those aspects of yourself to the forefront and working on them? And Okay, in some cases, accepting that's who you are, accepting your shadow self. Yeah, um, always. I love that. I love what you're talking about. Let me tell you a little bit about something about refugees and something that I'm doing in Africa. And it's called um, Pro Pro Project Diamond Mine. And it can't, it's coming out of something that I, that it's, it's working as in collaboration with the Kenyan government and the UNHRC to support them because they realize that there is some, they realize that it's very dangerous for the queer community to live inside a refugee camp because of the, because there's homophobic gangs and there's just, it's just, it's just, it's difficult for us. So we're, we're, we're on the ground in Kenya working with the UNHRC and the Kenyan government to move and relocate about 600 plus LGBTQ uh, refugees, asylum seekers who are living in the Concomit refugee camp. That's what that's going on right now. And uh, with with myself and Ava Henry, we've created this this but this formed out of a bigger project that we discovered called Building a Team of Champions, where we're creating this opportunity for you to to be able to hire people from countries like Kenya and put them to work and give them give it empower them with the ability to make money for themselves that's what that's how it got started because if people have the ability to earn an income then they have ability to take they have some freedom to take care of themselves the problem with living in the camp there's no way to make money so that's that's how i got involved with them and so we've got a project going on, a bigger project, which we're, 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 we're doing called Building a Team of Champions, where we're going to be connecting entrepreneurs on this side of the world, if you'll say, just on the, on the more, with, with, with refugees in order to hire them and give them a job and teach them the skills they need to have a job. But not just the skills to do the job. What we're, what we're really excited about in that project is a game changer, a disruptor in the way people work in relationships in virtual space. Because here's the problem. In virtual space, there's no chance for people to have any kind of relationship with each other. It's all task-driven, and there's no energy in task-driven. But we know from our experience working with Abba that when you work from a place of lo mutual love and support for each other, you're working in a place where you're more productive, you're more creative, and you have a whole lot more fun. So we're changing the workplace environment from being one that's that's dysfunctional to being one that's highly functional through this new program called Building a Team of Champions. Now, where are the champions going to come from? The intention all along was going to be the 600 plus LGBTQI asylum seekers living in the camp. But this is what we think and this is what we, I believe in so strong, and that is people first. People first, profits will follow. From my perspective, and what I've discovered is a diamond mine in that in that camp. From from to your point, from a lot from the African sort of the, from the African from the from the typical African's perspective, these people are worthless. They're gay. They're worthless. They're marginalized. They're probably some of the most despised people in the world. That's the truth. I mean, that's the reality. You, we just talked about that. It's all internalized homophobia, by the way, or, or, or some kind of internalized hate. we got to shift that around. So what, what I know to be true is these are diamonds. I could tell you right now that that diamond mine of 600 people is worth $3 million a year in annual revenues minimum. And so Project Diamond Mine is to work with the Kenyan government to relocate our best assets in the building uh, a team of champions project to a safe living environment so they can eat, sleep, live, work in a safe environment, and they can be in relationship and do their jobs. So the, what we, we've had to do a, a, a shift over here on our side to say the first priority is we've got to move our people to to, we got to move these diamonds, these beautiful, brilliant, smart, educated, 
queer people to a safe place to protect them and take care of them. That's what we're doing right now with what we call it Project Diamond Mine because they're diamonds. These are diamonds that people can't see. I see it. You see it. I'd like to get your thoughts about that being part of someone with the UN because we're and, and we're really grateful that the UN has been willing to work with us and meet with us and talk, see the problem and try to help us. I'm glad that they're doing that. Um, as a um, um, UN Globe only works on the internal issues, so we won't be able to comment on the external. And I think internally, you know, we are trying to change the culture, um, encourage our um, staff and colleagues to work on these mm -hmm. issues better. Um, so I think, you know, from a, from a, another perspective, ensure, you know, working on the livelihood generating, income generating activities and livelihood activities are key for LGBTIQ plus people living in very harsh uh, conditions. Um, you know, whilst we focus on decriminalization, LGBTIQ plus people still need to work, earn an income, uh, a decent work, and engage in decent work, have decent employment conditions, and have decent livelihoods. Often, what we do find is that LGBTIQ plus people are engaged in vulnerable, in, engaged in the informal economy, uh, engaged in formal work, labour market, where they are vulnerable to um, hazardous work, extreme forms of. Um, uh, extreme and vulnerable conditions, including um, uh, including forced labour. So, you know, what you have to do is then see how you can move them into a, into a more formal uh, economy and formal setting. And what you know, one way of that is you know helping them generate income and gen um, and generate a livelihood. I think it's 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 a, it's very very key. Yeah, it's key. On, uh, it, it, see, what, we, what we're working on is creating a win win for everybody here. Mm -hmm. We're creating a win for the Kenyan government because we're giving the, the, they have a, a lot invested. They, I think I think they, I think they're as a country, they have 400,000 refugees living in their country. And if we can help to take care of and protect one of the most vulnerable communities within that system, that's why they're willing to work with us, because we we're, we're providing them a wonderful service. And that's what we're very excited about. And we're also built by getting our own safe house over there. And we're going to move them into a place where we can be safe and they can take care of it. And they can be, they can learn. And we can, we're going to, we want to, we're going to create an academy where they can learn and become the best talent source in virtual space. The be, not only the best talents, but we're going to also teach. It's, it's just as important. This is the thing about our, our bigger program is that from, from, if we can change the way people work together in relationship, to be more productive, to be more excited, and, and, and like we are. I mean, Abba, since Abba came and worked for me, and, and, and we he he's an example. We're building this on our example. He was he was a, he was a, he was in the camp in December. He is now living in Nairobi because of what we did. I went over and I called. I, he called me over to help him with this project in a big in a big way. And I could not ignore it. I couldn't go over there and see the, the crisis that my brothers and sisters were living in and say, OK, well, good luck. I'm going back to the United States. I was like, this is something worth living for. So I, I refocused my whole business toward uh, taking care of my brothers and sisters and living in that camp. And this is what we've come up with. We've come up with this. Let's move them to a place where they can learn and live and, and be educated in a good, safe place. And let's also connect them with they take these brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people. And let's connect them with some people who can use good help and then teach them how to you how to have a relationship where they can actually work in a place of, of mutual love and support for one another. And it's, it's just amazing what we're doing. I'm so excited about it. And uh, that's just what I, so I will say, I want to just want to say, I wanted to ask you one thing, how, if, if people want to get to know you and get in touch with you, is there a way that people can get to know you, uh, what you're all about, what you're doing and uh, um, how do people well, find definitely. out want to get to um, know more about what you're doing and how you're making a difference in the world? Well, um, we have a website. It's www.unglobe.org. Um, I mean, that's for it's largely for internal. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's it's a group for inter in, uh, UN in, um, personnel, um, and so we engage in internal matters of the UN, not external, like you had uh, like you were mm -hmm. uh, referencing. Um, so that's where they can find out more about what we are and what we do. Um, I mean, personally, you can find me on, on LinkedIn as well as um, Instagram and or on um, Twitter as well. Well, you got a, you're just a lovely man. And I think people might like to get to know you more than that. <laughs> Since you work on an internal situation, people just might like to get to know you and 
have, have, a, have a good friendship with somebody who's been through a lot and who's out there advocating for our community. And that's that's why I wanted to offer that to you. I want to just put a little plug in right now. I'm, I'm where I want to say that we would love some help. We've got a very we got a, a small five thousand dollar GoFundMe campaign running right now to support this effort that we're doing in Africa. And we would truly love any amount that we get. Personally, this is what I would this is what I think about energy. Look, money is energy. And when money comes from the heart, it raises our vibration. So, you know, somebody could probably very easily write us a check for five thousand. There are people that wouldn't even they wouldn't even make an eye. And we'd love that too. Don't get me wrong. But we also, there's a lot of energy. If you think about this, if 5,000 people wrote us a check for a dollar, think of the vibrational shift on the planet. Think of the vibrational shift on the planet if everybody just gave something. Just gave, gave us $5, gave us $10. Think of the vibration. Last night I was walking home from an event in Manhattan. And there was a guy on the street who was just kind of a little crazy, a street person. But he said, I love you, brother. I love you, brother. And, he, and I just, I love you too, brother. And I just handed him $5. I just handed him $5. He needed it. He needed, he needed it more than I did. I felt so good from doing it. I didn't feel, I wouldn't feel, I just thought, this guy just told me he loved me. I love him too. I see the, I see the Christ in him. He sees the Christ in me. That's the story I made up anyway. That's just what I saw. And I said, the guy needs some money. He needs some help. He needs to be, he needs to be no, he needs to know someone cares about him more than the $5. And that's what that means. So I gave him $5. I didn't have a dollar. So I gave him five. But well, great. I, I won't ever, I never missed the $5. But, it, but what it did for me, my internal vibrational shift, it raised me up a little bit higher. And that's and that's and that's what we're talking about on the collective consciousness is to raise our conscious energy up to a higher vibration of love and vibration. So one way you can do that is to click on the link here and go to our GoFundMe campaign and make a small contribution. We would so much love that and so appreciate that to help us get this thing off the ground. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this episode of Speaking the Truth About Money with Martin Coward and Joy the Wise Woman. And thank you, Gertatten, for being part of our show with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. May love and prosperity prevail. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you are listening on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you are, please leave me a rating and review. Let me know what you appreciated, where we can improve, and any topic you want to know about for future episodes. If you would like to find out more ways you can participate in the Abundance Mindset and Prosperity Living Movement, join our private Facebook group, The Financial Mystics Sanctuary. If you are a gay, transgender, or bisexual man, ready and willing to explore how negative thinking about money is impacting you and our tribe, Join our private Facebook group, Financial Heart Space for Gay, Transgender, and Bisexual Men, a sanctuary for GBTQ business leaders to love and support each other. May love and prosperity prevail.